All right, here we go. It's Will Curran from Endless Entertainment. Welcome again to another edition of Hashtag Event Icons. You'll notice something really weird and different about this week. We have five people on screen. It's amazing. Uh, this week we have decided to switch up our platform and we have moved from Blab over to GoToWebinar. We wanted to make the experience as best possible for both our attendees and then also our panelists. Um, so we switched over to GoToWebinar and we hope you enjoy the new bump in quality and uh, everything like that related to the show. This week we have some absolutely amazing guests. I've been like literally sitting on my edge of my seat all week waiting for this show to happen uh, because these guys are absolutely fantastic. And I'm going to introduce them in just a second. For those who uh, might be tuning in for the first time, whether it's Mark or William, and this is your first show or into a million episodes of Hashtag Event Icons, this show is all about you guys, the audience, being able to ask questions of these amazing event icons. Uh, you know, I, as much as I'd love to sit here and just have a one-on-one -on -one conversation with Sarah, Andrew, and Rachel, we really here are here basically to get you guys to ask the questions that you want to know the answers to. So throughout the show, if you guys have any questions at all, over on the right-hand side, there's a question pane. Just feel free to type in your questions right on there, and we're going to be able to ask those questions right of our awesome, amazing icons of the events industry. So be sure to do that throughout the show, and we'll get ready to rock. Uh, speaking of other small things that we definitely would love your help on, we want to get as many people in here as possible to create an awesome conversation in that chat, uh, which, by the way, feel free to chat in there while you're in there. But if you guys can, just post this on social media, whether it's your Twitter account, your Facebook, your LinkedIn. Just hop on the social media for a quick second, share this link, tell your friends to get on in here, and let's get an awesome conversation going. So. Whew. That's enough, uh, you know, blabbing on my end. No pun intended on this one, that time. Um, but we want to get into the show and introduce our absolutely amazing icons of the events industry. So we're gonna start off with Sarah. Sarah, actually, uh, we met. Was it last week or two weeks ago? Yeah, <laughs> last week. Just, just barely last week, and I said, "Oh my gosh, we have to get you on the show as soon as possible." Uh, and we start talking a little bit more about, you know, how can we. You know, engage the uh, you know the CVBs and the local economy with events. And I knew I had to get Sarah on in here. So for those who have not met Sarah before, Sarah is the vice president of the San Francisco Giants Enterprise. Yep, you heard that right, the San Francisco Giants. Yep, the guys who you know kind of win lots of championships. Uh, she's also the director at large for ILEA, the International Live Events Association, which just rebranded from ISIS, the International Special Events Society. Uh, and she's on the board of governors for ILEA, also and leadership for San Francisco. Uh, Sarah's is responsible for all the biz dev and operations management for Giants Enterprises. Really like, she's a big deal, guys, um, which is also a subsidiary of the actual San Francisco Giants. Her role is to identify really awesome business opportunities for the enterprises, uh, including increasing visibility of at and Park, Pier 48, the yard at Mission Rock, and does a bunch of awesome other projects, including they just won the bid for the 2018 Rugby World Cup, um, which is just super cool. Uh, I'm going to make sure I get tickets to that one, right, Sarah? <laughs> awesome. So fun fact about Sarah, too, she rode a live bull on her 30th birthday. So watch yeah. out. Out here in Arizona. Arizona. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you so much for joining us, Sarah. <laughs> no problem. Awesome. Our next guest is Andrew Van Lucian. Uh, Andrew and I were chatting last week a little bit about his history, and he's doing some absolutely awesome, awesome things. He's the CEO of Jackrabbit Systems and Zarista, and in, two, in 1997, he actually started Walker Digital, which was the parent company of uh, Priceline.com. So he was the number six employee at Priceline.com, um, and uh, sorry, started at Walker Digital, uh, and was the number six employee at Priceline.com. And he's done some really, really awesome things. We're having a really, really great conversation about you know how do Priceline.com affect local economies and hotels and everything like that. And I knew this was going to be another great fit for this week's show. Um, he's you had been with them for eight years and started tons and tons of different e-commerce and software companies. But in 2003, you left New York and moved back to Santa Fe, New Mexico. Welcome back to the Southwest. <laughs> and you found and sold several companies. This guy's serial entrepreneur written all over him right here. Uh, and currently, he's working on Jackrabbit Systems. In March of this year, they acquired Zarista, which I'm sure we're going to talk a lot about what Zarista is and everything like that. Um, but another fun fact about Andrew is that he actually named on over 316 patents. 316 patents, Andrew? That's right. That's right. 
<laughs> awesome, awesome. Well, we're so happy to have you here. Thank you for joining us, Andrew. Thanks for having me. <laughs> awesome, awesome. And last but not least, drum roll, please. It's Rachel Pearson. Rachel is the Vice President of Community and Government Affairs at the Scottsdale Community and Visitors Bureau, CVB. Um, believe it or not, Rachel and I are both natives of Arizona, and we have never met, which is, you know, we're like a rare breed, <laughs> us native Arizonians that stick around. So um, we're, I'm definitely excited to have her on the show. She's been at various positions within the CVB since 2001 uh, and received her accredited business communicator ABC designation in 2009. Uh, Rachel, like I said, is native of Arizona. She went to Chaparral High School for anyone who's from Arizona uh, and lives in Scottsdale with her husband, Mike, daughter, Paige, and her Rhodesian Ridgeback, Kayla, which I learned is actually not a horse, is actually a dog. Uh, <laughs> and fun fact, Rachel actually recently started doing abstract acrylic painting, which shows that she has some true talent, which I do not have. <laughs> <laughs> So thank you so much for joining us, Rachel. Thank you. Awesome. And last but not least, you can see her hanging out there all quiet, some over in the corner, Miss Laura Lopez, our co-host for this week. Uh, Laura is absolutely awesome. She's been hosting while I've been traveling like crazy across the country and the world. Um, so you guys are definitely no stranger to her in joining us today. So thank you so much for joining us too, Laura. Thanks for having me. Awesome. Well, hey, Laura, you know what? I talked way too much just now. I'm, I'm, I'm going to kick this off to you. You want to go ahead and ask him off that, that first iconic question that we ask everybody? Oh, yes. So question number one is what got you all into the events industry? So I guess we'll start with Andrew first. What got you into the events industry? Sure, sure. So um, Jackrabbit Systems uh, makes a white label search engine and we work with city and state tourism offices uh, across the country and in Canada and the Caribbean. And we work with 250 different CPBs. Um, and we were, you know, that's sort of the leisure side of, of, of what those tourism offices do. And there's always the, the meetings and events side. And we were looking to diversify into the event side. And um, the venture capitals that had invested in us had also had invested in Zarista. And the Zarista CEO had left. And it looked like a really good opportunity or a good way for us to, to transition into events by buying Zarista. And, and Zarista is a mobile app that people use when they go to events to kind of plan the event and meet with people and play games. And then it collects data so that uh, the event planners can, can kind of figure out what went well and what didn't go well before. Um, so, it, you know, it was basically just to build out what we're doing and Jackrabbit in, into um, sort of the other sector that, that uh, CBBs work on. Awesome. So cool. So cool. What about you, Sarah? What got you into the events industry? Um, I actually started as an intern with the San Francisco Giants. So I, um, I was playing sports in college in Berkeley, and our coach made us go to an athlete career fair. And so I showed up there. I was thinking I was going to be headed to D.C. for an internship um, on Capitol Hill, but I decided that I would rather stay home and get a job with a baseball team. And then once I graduated, that turned into my full-time job, and I've been kind of moving around the Giants' ranks ever since then. Awesome. Awesome. Um, just qu quick question. What, like, you know, for you to move all the way from intern to, you know, v vice president of Giants Enterprises, do you, you, you basically know everything about the Giants, don't you? <laughs> um, I, I do know a lot, yeah. I think it, it helps definitely to know everything from, I mean, I was, part of the team that built the first electronic ticket relay system well before the days of StubHub and before Ticketmaster and any of those guys were doing it. So it was neat to be on the ground floor for stuff like that. But yeah, I can tell you how to wrap a hot dog or mow the lawn or do whatever you want to do in that place. <laughs> awesome, awesome, awesome. Rachel, what about you? So how how'd you get involved in the CVB? Well, kind of like Sarah, I guess I just kind of got started in it uh, right out of college, actually. So. Um, didn't want the job because I had no idea what a convention and visitors bureau did. I did not understand what they what they did, so I didn't really want the job, but I took it anyways. Um, and about two days in, I realized I'd made an amazing decision, and I've been here ever since. So um, it's an awesome place to work, and I love being in the tourism industry. There's always something going on. There's always something new, and um, so I haven't ever wanted to leave. Awesome. Do you think it helped uh, for being a native to be like? Involved in obviously uh, 
an organization that's designed to get people to come to Arizona, being a native, do you think that really helped you, or do you think that you know you 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 feel like you're like, man, have I had too much of Arizona? No, I think because I love Arizona and I I love being in Scottsdale. That um, that's just a great part about it is I get to promote a place that I live and that I love and. Um, that I'm choosing to raise my family, and so I think that really actually helps to create a lot of that excitement and passion. Awesome. Uh, very cool, very cool. Well, I'm really excited to have you guys all here. Laura, you want to go ahead and uh, uh, ask maybe one, either one of the questions from the audience or one of our next questions? Yes, we do have a question in from the audience. So. Let's see here. Uh, we have a question from Mark. So, um, oh, interesting. So, Mark, I'm not sure where you are located, but uh, his question is for the non-Americans: What's a CVB, and what does it do? So, we have some international folks on. So, I guess that's very much in American terms. So, what's the role of a CVB in tourism? So uh, a CVB stands for Convention and Visitors Bureau, and basically we are the organization responsible for marketing the destination. So um, they have what basically marketing organizations in any major city around the world, um, and it's that organization that's responsible for putting out a great brand for the destination, talking about all the amenities. So before a visitor decides that they want to go to a particular hotel or they want to go to a particular spa, um, or they want to go to maybe even a particular event, um, they're thinking about what kind of a destination do I want to go to? So do I want to go to Scottsdale or do I want to go to Palm Springs? Or do I want to go to Ireland or do I want to go to Scotland? So in making those decisions, uh, those marketing organizations are out there saying, pick me. <laughs> we're, the, we're the destination that you want to come to. And so that's really the role of um, a CBB. It, it's, and it's funny it's that funny. you mentioned Ireland. Because he's from Ireland, the, the gentleman oh, Mark awesome. Breen question. So, um, <laughs> awesome question. Um, where does um, just so uh, I guess so people can understand too, um, you know, where does the funding for a CVB come from? Does it come from you know private organizations, primarily the government? You know, how does that end up working? Honestly, it's different all over the place. But for us in particular, most of our funding comes from the bed tax. So when you stay at a hotel, you're charged maybe sales tax, and there's also another fee that we call bed tax, and that bed tax goes to the city, and a portion of it comes to help fund our efforts. Awesome, awesome. And I guess, um, you know, starting with Andrew, Andrew, what was your kind of role with interacting with CVBs? How much interaction do you usually have with them, and like, what is your role kind of, you know, to deal with the CVBs? You know, it, it kind of depends on the CVB, um, but... Uh, what really happened with why I started Jackrabbit, um, I moved from Priceline and we had invented all these ways to kind of like suck all the money out of the hotel business or the events business or the airline business. And I sort of knew what all that bag of tricks was. And I was sitting in Santa Fe just because I moved back here because that's where I'm from. And I could see that the city had all this traffic to its website, but it really didn't know what to do with it. So it's sort of you know turning Priceline upside down and saying, okay, how do we you know use the traffic that the city has on its website and give all that money back? You know, like Santa Fe is a market where maybe there's 120 million dollars of hotel room sales, and you know 10 to 15 million dollars a year goes to the OTAs. It's, it, you know, just gets pulled out of the industry. And you know, at the time there was enough traffic on the on the Santa Fe website that if you created a search engine like we had that that gives a, a direct booking to the hotel, um, essentially at a no cost or a low cost. Because uh, a lot of times the, the cities and the states lease our software so that the hotels pay nothing. That essentially you're taking that bed tax that is funding the CBB and you're using it to give direct bookings to the hotels. Uh, so it just felt like, you know, and, and that's what the hotels want more than anything that are funding this. And then consumers are actually looking for that too. They don't actually want to book with Priceline, they want to book with the hotel if you make it easy for them. Um, so I was, you know, really involved in, in the first, I don't know, 25 different cities just kind of working it out, all the different things they wanted. Um, you know, right now, you know, we have a distributed sales team all across the country and we just opened an office in London and, um, you know, it's, it's expanding, but I'm, I'm working a lot in Canada. They're working on a countrywide rollout so that every CVB, every province, and, and actually the, you know, the, the national government is all using the system up there. It's called Checking Canada. Um, so I've been spending a lot of time up there because we're trying to get a whole country to do this because we think that it becomes very powerful. It's sort of like if all the CDBs unified their marketing budgets, 
then they have more money to spend than Expedia or Priceline does. Um, but because they work sort of individually, they, they don't really think of themselves that way, that the money kind of gets gets uh, dissipated. So we've kind of thought of it as, you know, we, we've got 250 different TVBs that use our software, and that's about, about 1,400 in the U.S. And, and Canada and the Caribbean. Um, so as, as that you know, adoption gets bigger, the brand itself gets bigger, but it's sort of like, oh, yeah, government tourism is a really good brand if you want good deals and direct booking. Um, so it's taken a little longer than we thought. Government moved a little bit slowly, and not everybody's thinking, like, yeah, I'd like to be on a unified front. But it, but it is slowly happening, and every step of the way, like, you know, we have more data, we have more things to work with than we didn't have before. Awesome. Awesome. Um, and then Sarah, I know that, so Sarah introduced me to Rachel, um, and so obviously you guys do a ton of work together. T tell me a little bit about your relationship with the Scottsdale CVB. So for those who don't know, um, Arizona, we do a lot of spring training in Arizona, so we bring in tons of baseball teams during spring training time, and one of those teams is the Giants. Um, so can you talk a little bit about what your interaction is with Rachel and what you kind of do to promote the CVB and that sort of stuff? Sure. So. Um... The connection really started because I manage spring training for the Giants, so I pretty much relocate out here the entire month of March, um, and I'm responsible basically for the product that people are all flying into Arizona for. So we're booking massive amounts of hotels that month because so many people are coming in from California to enjoy the weather and get to see the baseball team early. Um, and it also tied into the work I do back home because when we're marketing our venue, we're about a mile from our convention center, so a lot of our business comes from the conferences that are in town. So we work extremely closely with the Convention Visitors Bureau in San Francisco, um, and we are, you know, reaching out to clients that are bringing their groups to San Francisco two years in advance, six months in advance, whatever it may be, so that we can host a lot of their large events when they come into town. Um, and so there's a great sales synergy there. They're already selling our city, and then we take it one step further by saying, now here's a whole bunch of places you can go to host your events and to have reputable event producers and that sort of thing. Um, and so knowing that Scottsdale is definitely a second home for a lot of our fans from San Francisco, I got started to think about how important that group um, is to Scottsdale and how important events are to us when we're here as a fan. Um, and I know, and Rachel will probably talk a little bit more about it, but Scottsdale is definitely making a push to be uh, much more inclusive and much more of a home for events throughout the year, um, but specifically in times that they're trying to drive traffic um, in the tourism sector. And so it just it made a lot of sense to kind of connect all the dots and say, okay, we need to be more involved with the, with the Convention Visitors Bureau out here on a year-round basis as well. Awesome. Awesome. Fantastic. Laura, that's so all you. There's a little bit of a delay, so I was like, I see Mel's moving, but um, okay. <laughs> All right, awesome. Um, very cool. Wait, Andrew, so, did you have, do you have something you want to add? Yes. Oh, I just wanted to know. So, so like, it seems pretty clear that you know during spring training when you're there, um, you know any any event that's going on, they would might stay an extra day to go see a game. But then, how, how do you see that going on throughout the year that that you can help the the city uh, drive more traffic? Well, because we have our, our baseball team plays out here in March specifically, but we have some of our guys that are playing out here in what we call the Rookie League or the Fall League throughout the year. So we actually do have a mechanism to drive um, our fans out here throughout the year. Uh, but we also work in Scottsdale Stadium, which is a fantastic venue downtown. And I think our hope is, uh, you know, Scottsdale's going through a lot of positive change right now, and they're really kind of embracing master planning and transportation, and they're looking at things a lot differently um, just as a city as a whole, and I think that growth provides some opportunity, and, and the Giants, because we're invested here and because Scottsdale has taken such good care of us, we feel like if we do it really well back home in San Francisco, maybe we can help. Maybe our venue can become a little bit more multi-purpose here a couple years down the road so that we can help drive large community events where they could be watching a movie out on the big screen during the warmer summer months or, you know, a whole bunch of different programming and event-based activity that, that the Giants might be able to help foster here given our venue presence, even if our team's not physically here the whole time. And that brings us to a good question that was posed in the audience, um, and this is for Sarah. Um, how many events happen um, at the field outside of games? So I think if I know my venue, uh, my venue jargon, that those are considered dark days. So that's basically just any day that there isn't a game. So um, on average, how many events are you hosting, and 
what's uh, maybe could you give us a couple of examples of events that you are hosting at the venue or at, sure. at the park? So, yeah, so you're correct. We don't do anything on game days, basically. If there's an orange box on the calendar, that's a baseball day. Um, so there's 81 <laughs> games a year out of 162 game season. So basically we have the remainder, you know, 200 plus days a year to really be out there um, kind of marketing our venue. We host about 160 events at the ballpark. Um, and most events that we do are 300 people or more. Um, we do concerts, we do private concerts for a lot of the conventions that are in town. We'll do dinner parties for 2,000 people. Um, we don't typically do too much in the social sector, like weddings and proms and bar mitzvahs. We usually don't do too much of that just because our venue is so big that it's sometimes very expensive to operate for smaller type events. Um, but that's where the synergy with the Convention and Visitors Bureau works so well is because that building is chock full the whole year. So there's a built-in group for us to continue to pull our event business from year-round. Very cool. Oh, and that, oh, sorry. Go ahead. Well, this one's you. <laughs> oh, I was going to say, I, I, I just find it really, really interesting, like, you know, that you're saying that, hey, like, it's really expensive for you to have the venue, but then you still find other ways to do things, too, there. And I think that... You know, a lot of times people, when they're plan getting into event planning the first time, they think, wow, these big stadiums, it must be extraordinarily expensive to, to do, but sometimes they're actually within reason and a great venue for concerts or, you know, alternative styles of events for sure. Um, well, that's exactly yeah. why we kind of branch out outside of our venue. So we use the parking lot. We have a shipping container we just built out. We have a pier. So it doesn't all have to be in the ballpark. Those are just that's the 160 ballpark events that we do, and then we do stuff all in and around that downtown area. Um, and so, it, to your point, we do try to have a venue for everyone, whether it's a smaller event or a bigger event. Awesome, awesome. I, I guess to kind of transition out of the, you know, a lot of times people think that, oh, obviously, you know, baseball games are going to be a huge impact on the economy, right? Especially like the spring training, it's huge here in Arizona. We get tons and tons of people coming. But I think one of the questions that is on a lot of people's tongue is, at what point does an event actually affect the economy and truly provide impact? I guess, Rachel, since you're dealing with a lot of events coming into Scottsdale, can you give an example as far as how much impact it really does have or how much an event really just needs to do to have an impact? Can it be a five-person event or does it have to be a 50,000 person spring training season? <laughs> Well, for the right amount of money being brought in, five people can certainly have an impact. Um, <laughs> we see that with some really big, expensive meetings. But, um, you know, for an event, it really doesn't necessarily matter the size. And sometimes it just depends on things like seasonality. So, if, you know, obviously our hotter months in the middle of the summer, we have fewer events and fewer people coming. So if somebody builds a small event that brings in, you know, a, a small regional um, interest, that can have a really great impact on our community where if you're trying to bring in a small event in March and you're competing with the Giants, you may not have quite the impact. Our rooms are already full, um, our vendors are already busy, um, you know, restaurants are packed, and so trying to compete with another event like that, you may not have the same impact. But if you consider the um, seasonality, the, the quality of the attendee, um, obviously, if someone's going to pop into the city, spend a couple bucks, and leave, the impact's not big. But if those people are going to come here for multiple days, stay in our hotels, participate in other activities and amenities in the destination, that value becomes kind of exponential. Um, and so we certainly see that with events that it doesn't necessarily take a huge footprint to make a big impact. Uh, and Andrew, I think that you know you kind of talked about how Santa Fe is kind of a smaller tourism destination. Uh, I was saying that that's usually where I end up stopping by on my way to Texas, um, you know, and everything like that. What what have you been seeing locally? Because obviously you've done tons of research on this because that's like your space. Have you seen that there's bigger impact in smaller markets versus bigger markets, or you know how does that work out for you guys? I, well, like some of our markets are really tiny, and you know almost all of them have a convention center. And a lot of the time it's empty. So I think any time that that fills up, any way that you can do it, it makes a huge difference. Um, like I, with the way that you're asking the question, I think, you know, the second that somebody lands in Albuquerque, you're having an economic impact, you know, however big or however small. Um, and I think, like, it's got to be hard in Scottsdale to get people to come do events in the summer. It's just so hot. Um, and, you yeah. know, things that a lot of it, yeah. The things that a lot of the CBBs are doing are just, what can I do with an event to get people to stay an extra day, or bring their family, or do things like that. 
Um, and, I, and I think that's where, you know, there's a lot of power that, you know, if the CVB really focused on, okay, this group of people's coming for four days, how do I get them to bring their family? How do I get them to stay the weekend? And, you know, turn business into a sort of a quasi-leisure trip can actually kind of expand the stay, like you said, where the hotel rooms um, may not be full after the event, but they're full during the event. So to stretch that out makes a big difference to the hotels, and then all the trickle-down from there is pretty significant in pretty much all markets. Awesome. Fantastic. Uh, Sarah, is there anything you want to add to that at all from what you've been seeing? Um, well, just one thing I think is important for anybody is that now you never know what events are going to have impact because of social media. And if you have an influencer that's attending an event, it may be an event for 10 people, but if they've got 40,000 followers and they're in the leisure space and all of a sudden other people start to see what they're doing, you just never know where it's going to come from. Um, we in San Francisco did a campaign. Um, our city is seven miles by seven miles, so it's 49 square miles, but we were realizing that all the tourists spend 48 hours in San Francisco and then they leave. And so we did a massive campaign with the Convention Visitors Bureau that was just that 49th hour in San Francisco and just tipping the scale enough to get them there for one more day. And what we realized is, you know, you can have the America's Cup, which is a one-time event that brings in thousands of people, or you can have thousands of people who are already here staying for one extra day. Both of them are going to be a huge impact to the bottom line. Um, and cities need to have the diversification to be able to handle and market and cater to both groups, I think. Very interesting. And then a follow-up to that. That's interesting that you bring up influencers. Do you ever reach out, actively reach out to them for different events that you have so you can make sure that you fill a room, or is that just sort of, serendipitous where you know you do have an influencer that attends and then all of a sudden that 10 person event now is a 250 person event so the question is do you actively reach out to them and um, how often do you do that yeah I mean speaking for us as a venue we certainly do that um, we don't obviously invite you know maybe reporters to a private event, but um, we'll do showcasing events and make sure that influencers are there. Uh, last year at spring training, we actually brought out some travel writers with the, in partnership with uh, the Scottsdale CBB, and they were, you know, some were from Canada, some were from California, they were from all different locations, uh, and just hosted them, because once they go back and tell their story, they might bring two, three, four, or 10 people, you know, the next year, and a lot of the stories were geared outside of the spring training month. So it was, this maybe may have been the mechanism for me to see Scottsdale for the first time, but once I got here, here were all of the other amazing things that I want to come back for. And so that speaks a little bit to Rachel, or to, yeah, Rachel's comment about seasonality is just, you know, it's important to drive traffic in March, but if they've already got it there, it's, it's dynamic pricing, right? It's, there are people who are looking for good deals, and if there's an opportunity for Scottsdale to capitalize on that in some other times, those are certainly people you want to keep informed of, of what your opportunities are. Awesome. Awesome. Then, um, Andrew, do you have anything to add to that? Have you seen any examples of, um, I guess, like influencers having an influence on any of the, the events that you've attended? or um, maybe some of the CVPs you've worked with, or maybe, again, since Santa Fe is such a small, as a much, comparatively speaking, a, a smaller uh, destination, um, how do influencers come into play? You know, it's, I, it's kind of all across the board, and, and there's all kinds of strategies, and it's hard to know, you know, how a CVB should spend its money. Um, you know, you could spend in markets where, you know, that are always the draw markets, like Santa Fe sort of, everybody comes from Texas. And it's like, you know, if you spend there, you're going to get the, the, the customers or maybe you would have gotten those customers otherwise. Um, but then if you, you know, try and build out your brand into markets that aren't necessarily part of your brand, uh, it's sometimes very expensive and it flops. And it's sort of like a lot of the hotels that I know of that run the boards on the CVB sort of say, take your chance like that because we, nobody else will take that chance and let's try and get, you know, people from, you know, Chicago to go to Calgary more often or whatever it is. Um, you know, as far as the question about um, examples of cities that are doing uh, interesting things to create more opportunities, um, I, I think that uh, CVBs uh, that fund new events actually do a lot of good with that. Like uh, Calgary has, has a, they call it a DMF fund. So in addition to the bed tax, the hotels all have a voluntary 3% marketing fee that they collect. And there's a whole bunch of cities that are doing this now. So, so it's sort of a hotel-controlled uh, marketing fund that's 3% of sales, and, you know, we're trying to get them to spend on, you know, getting hotel rooms uh, to be booked direct, but 
They're also spending it on creating brand new events that have never happened in the city, you know, maybe finding a, an empty venue and, and using it to do that. And just by doing that, there's, you know, and, and picking, you know, times of the year when it's dead, right? So it's like, you know, let's figure out how to get people to, to, to do whatever needs to happen in the dead month of, of that. And, you know, sometimes they flop completely, but even that is, you know, they learn from it and, and you know, it, it's a test. And then sometimes it's really successful and it, and it really builds out from there. Um, so it's sort of like the CVB has an opportunity to, to try new events at weird times to see if something sticks because, you know, a business person couldn't take that chance, but it, but it tends to work if, if you try enough different things. And I'll just add to that that um, we've got something similar in Scottsdale where there's half of the bed tax comes to the Bureau for our marketing, but the other half goes back to the city. And a lot of those funds are set aside specifically for um, the creation of new events and also um, helping events that are already here continue to grow, get bigger, get a, a larger draw. So there's different buckets of funds for small community events, events that are just getting started and are new and need help kind of ramping up, and then events that are tried and true, but the city still wants to support them. And then there's, you know, for brand new events, for mega events, there's funds. Um, and so it's definitely something if, if people are thinking about Scottsdale, we want to be there to help them get them into the right venues. and as we've talked about multiples um, from a seasonality perspective, if you come during a time when there's more need, you can get more funds. So we're really trying to encourage people, again, not, you know, don't just bring your event in March, but think about your event in October or November where the weather is amazing here and yet we just don't have the event calendar that we do in the spring. Um, and so there's a lot of opportunities for event producers um, and for events to grow in this community because of that. So a good follow-up to that, Rachel, is um, how can planners do a better job um, of involving the city and the community to get the most out of their events? Um, you know, I think that working with the Convention and Visitors Bureau and working with the city um, gives them a chance to understand where some of the needs and opportunities are. Um, and so if you're, if you're local, you may already have a good idea of that. If you're coming from out of market, you may not really know who the audiences are or all the venue options. Um, you know, Sarah kind of mentioned this before, you might realize that there's a big stadium, but did you realize that they have, um, was it a shipping container? Yeah. <laughs> a shipping container or a parking lot or a pier. And so, you know, sometimes it's not until you really get into the nitty gritty that you realize that there's so much more opportunity than you thought. And so that's something where working with our staff and working with city staff, that they can help you explore well beyond your initial thoughts, um, connect you to some great local partners, um, find out about things like funding. We're always so shocked by how many people don't realize that there's all this money available to them um, and they wish that they'd known. Um, and so even just finding out about things like that, I think really allow an event to become more ingrained in the community um, and hopefully make more money and do better because they, they have a better understanding of what's really needed. Sarah, do you have any um, examples of what you think that you know, planners could do to engage with their CVBs a little bit better. I know you're a huge advocate of it as well. Um, I, for me personally, I think continuing education is a, is a huge thing. Um, so in our department at work, we definitely recommend that people join industry associations. So whether it's ILEA or MPI or PCMA or NACE or Green Meetings Industry Council, do something to get out there and meet people because you're going to learn from those people. and. You know, it's, it's been a very recent conversation that tourism and events has been so closely connected. It used to be that tourism was the industry and then there were these random party planners that didn't really know what they were doing. And now that parties, quote unquote, has gotten so much more strategic, I mean, it is controlling massive marketing budgets. And, you know, you've gone away from sponsorship and now it's experiential marketing. So everything is starting to revolve around events and now it's starting to own its place in the tourism segment. And as that conversation continues, I think it's going to be more and more important for people to reach across the table and say, okay, I haven't necessarily worked with the hotels before because I'm an event planner, but I need to know what's important to you so that I can make sure to build my business and build this industry collectively in a way that's going to kind of make all shifts rise um, with the rising tide. Um, you know, whether you're a hotel or a one-time event, if you're spending local and bringing money into your community, it's going to have a long-term benefit. Um, and so I think if we can all work together on that kind of stuff, it just it makes that a lot more more powerful movement. Fantastic. 
Andrew, what about you? I mean, you obviously are a big proponent of, you know, getting, you know, uh, getting away from the OTAs and everything like that, away from the price lines and moving more towards driving money to the CVBs and the hotels directly. Do you have any ideas for event planners to, uh, you know, be able to be engaged with their CVB a little bit more? Well, I, I think everybody should be using technology a lot. It, it's um, both, both the sectors, I mean, they're, they're kind of, you, you know, price line, Everybody that was interested in technology built Priceline, right? And then a lot of us are off doing things, but what you find in the event space or in the DMO space is not necessarily technology people, right? You have people, people there, you know, and, and it's really shifting where the tools like Zarista a, a can make an event 10 times more effective and it can promote the city and it can do all kinds of things. But a lot of that is sort of taking, you know, Priceline level of, of technology and putting it in the hands of, of people that aren't used to using technology and so, you know, I, I think that embracing technology and learning about it, there's so much good stuff that people aren't even using that can help make these things happen. I mean, um, you look at events, and I think there's like 1.3 million events in the U.S. every year, and I think it's it's growing exponentially as people say, oh yeah, there's an empty venue, and here's an easy here's an easy piece of technology that sell tickets to an event and make things happen. Um, but you know, the, the sort of the goal is if you kind of obsess on technology to make your life easy you can maximize all of these venues and, and maximize CBP budgets to, to really, you know, have parties all the time, I guess, would be what it would, what it would be, but it's really true. <laughs> awesome, awesome, fantastic. Um, well, I, I, you kind of, like, I came up with a couple, you talked a little, Andrew, a little bit about ideas and examples of cities that are doing this really, really well. Um, you know, Sarah, Rachel, do you guys have any more examples of cities that are just, like, you think are crushing it completely in the, you know, the tourism and bringing the right events to the, you know, to their space and, move, you know, figuring out ways to attract the right event planners in the biggest events? You know, from a lot of what we talk about are some of the, maybe the, the typical examples, but just seeing things that Austin has done and that um, Palm Springs has done and really attracting some big events that are appealing to um, multiple generations, um, they've been able to grow from potentially kind of small events originally into multi-day or multi-weekend events now um, and things that are starting to attract other sectors. So it's not just tourism, but it's economic development. So it's seeing that, you know, some of these conferences that maybe started out as like music, now they're technology and they're attracting, um, you know, technology companies to the area. And so while we're a tourism organization, we know that tourism has an impact on economic development, and so it's kind of a long game for the community. And so seeing some of those events that have been able to um, really make that transformation from just a tourism event or a party to now an economic development driver um, are impressive and something that I think um, our community is definitely paying attention to and hoping that we can continue to kind of emulate in our own way. Awesome. Uh, I would absolutely agree with those markets. I think Seattle is another one that's done a good job of, you know, creating their own like bumper shoot festival and, and doing things that really are seafair, doing things that um, are specific to their location and are good both locally and that draws them um, some travel from afar. And then the other one I think that's really interesting right now is um, the U.S. Travel Association. They're actually starting an initiative called Project Time Off, and basically it's to try to get people to utilize all of that paid leave that goes kind of unrealized throughout the year. So they're working with strategic employers, travel, tourism destinations, and telling people, let's just get everybody to take one of those days. Just take one day off, even if you don't go anywhere, attend a baseball game in your market, go see a football game, attend a concert, go eat in a restaurant that you haven't been at before, go see a local park. Um, and I think that that's one of those kind of organic homegrown initiatives that while they're starting small, I think the implications of that could be tremendous because I think very quickly you'll see people take one day that leads to a long weekend that leads to a hotel stay somewhere else. Um, so I think that's going to be interesting to watch over the next year or so as well. I think that's fantastic too. It's like getting little small habits and changing people's behavior just a little bit. I, I love it. Uh, by the way, it looks like we have a very exciting person who joined us just now, Mr. Sean Holiday, one of our co-hosts um, from Crowd Mics. Uh, if you guys haven't ever heard of Crowd Mics, you guys definitely have to check it out. Uh, but uh, really happy to have you here today, Sean. Awesome. Thanks for having me. I'm excited to, <laughs> excited to learn. I'm, I'm learning about the uh, CBB model and, and how that works. <laughs> so, um, and I believe Laura, do you do you have to jet out? So I do. So I just want to say bye. <laughs> Thanks, guys. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank you.
Um, so going back into you know how you you talk about how it's like little small habits, Sarah, and little things that slightly make the change. How do you think that? So we talked about like how can they engage with the CBB, but how can people maximize when they have their event to ma to improve like the economy to get the most out of it for the economy? Is it you know? telling their attendees to avoid Airbnbs? Is it like, you know, telling people, hey, um, instead of, you know, serving all the food in the convention center, have them go out and get restaurant food? What do you guys think are the things that really allow people to get the most into the economy when they're producing an event? Uh, Rachel, you want to kind of start with that? Sure, I'll start. And, and I'll say real quickly that I don't necessarily agree with either thing you just said. So I don't think that um, you have to stay in a hotel to have an impact on the tourism community. I know Airbnb, Airbnb Home Away, all, the, all those rentals, they're so new to the market, people are still getting their hands around the impacts. But at the end of the day, if somebody comes to our destination and has an incredible experience, they will come back. They will tell other people and those people will come here. And so even if they only eat in the convention center, as long as that convention center has an awesome experience, um, then it can still have an impact. Of course, I think if you're in a destination, the more you get out and explore, the more you can kind of experience the destination like a local. We know that people want to go to the places that locals like, the restaurants and the parks and the events that, that you know, attract the people who live here. They're going to walk away with that awesome experience, and that, I think, is what really matters. How they get to that experience and what their choices are, that's, a, that's personal, and I don't think it matters. Awesome. I would agree. I mean, I know San Francisco feels the same way because we just simply don't have enough hotel rooms. So, you know, for one of our big conferences last year, they actually brought in a cruise ship and they had a bunch of the attendees stay on a cruise ship because we don't have enough room. So Airbnb is one of the biggest members of our Convention and Visitors Bureau right now, and they work very closely together. Um, and I think to Andrew's point earlier, a lot of it's technology and not over-programming. Um, it's very easy to put together an app for your event that shows what other local you know amenities are what the restaurants are different things to try even again local parks free things for them to experience um, so just make sure to arm them with that information and then don't over program them give them a little bit of time to explore on their own um, you know we've gotten in this world where everybody feels like everything needs to be scheduled and i tend to think that white space is often one of the most effective tools that you can have be it in an event or a whole weekend of programming um, it's really important to let people clear their head and experience their own stuff a little bit Awesome, fantastic. Even, even scheduling the downtime in an event would, would help, right? Like, this is white space, go do something else. Exactly, <laughs> yeah. Andrew, I love it. Andrew, what about you? Any yeah. thoughts for you? Yeah, I, I'd have to agree about the Airbnb comment. I mean, there's cities that are embracing it, and it's just, that means, you know, collecting taxes and, and, and encouraging it. And there's cities that are fighting it, and I, I just think fighting it is so silly. I mean, it, it just feels like that's, that's somebody that wants a different experience in a hotel room, even if there are plenty of hotel rooms and they come to Airbnb. Um, you know, especially in a lot of our, our smaller markets like Santa Fe, I mean, half the town is just second or third homes. And if those get rented out, it's much better for the economy than if they're sitting vacant all the time. Um, but, but it's sort of, I, I think uh, a lot of the things that it seems like we've talked about are sort of like, okay, those second homes that are empty for 50 weeks out of the year or you know, a, a venue that, that only has, you know, four months of, of real time and the rest of it's open, um, filling up those empty spaces. I mean, it seems to be sort of a trend in technology now, even with Uber, you know, somebody has a car and they have time to give rides to people, all that kind of thing. And, and just looking for those pockets of things that aren't getting used to their full potential and figuring out to, how to do something with that actually has a huge effect on, on, on all this tourism stuff. Um, I mean, you can look at all those categories and that's what's happening. I completely agree, and I appreciate the insight from everyone kind of on that specific topic. I, I want to transition a little bit, Andrew, specifically, you know, kind of get your insights. You know, a couple of years back, you know, nobody had an event app, right? Now that you've recently acquired Zarista, and now all of a sudden it's, it's a standard almost. If you get to an event, you want to expect to see the scheduling and the speaker profile and also what else is going on in the city, right? Uh, what's the next step for the CVBs? What, what, what do you see being kind of the next phase of technology that, that's not quite there yet? Oh, so I, I would say that the biggest thing that's held back Zarista as a mobile app is uh, the quality of the Wi-Fi in the venue, right? So if, if, you, if the convention is going on in a center or a hotel uh, where, you know, the, the convention's in the basement or the event's in the basement or it, it's in the convention center, 
and uh, the Wi-Fi isn't working perfectly for everybody and you don't have to pay for it, then our app really just doesn't work. I mean, it, it looks like the app is broken just because it, it, just because the communication's not there. And part of the reason why we, we are so excited about Zarista is I think they've been battling with Wi-Fi until, you know, about this year where everybody gets this, like, there needs to be great Wi-Fi everywhere. And then suddenly, like, things change. I mean, you can just communicate better than when it when it isn't everywhere. And it seems like such a small thing, but, like, the quality of that is going to make a huge difference to, you know, having these mobile apps work 100%. Um, and it's just little stuff like, all right, you're trying to text with somebody in our app, and then, you know, you have to actually go and leave and go to your hotel room, and then all the, the messages download because the Wi-Fi wasn't working. And it just looks like the app wasn't working. It looks like the event didn't do a good job. Um, so it's almost sort of like, you know, this, this sort of handheld device really needs to be wired in, and then it can kind of supercharge the experience that you're having. Um, so those kind of those two things are definitely converging right now to, to make it so that event apps that have become essential, like you feel weird when you go to an event and it isn't there, but it also has to work 100% all the time too. So, um, so I, I think that right now that's why you're just kind of seeing an explosion in this where it's like a must-have. Yeah. Ra Rachel, kind of on that same topic, how often do you have clients come to you and planners come to you and ask specifically, like, what's the best Wi-Fi you know, or tech venue in your city? You know, do you get that type of response as they're kind of planning for their group? You know, I think with a lot of our venues, um, we're kind of an interesting destination because we don't actually have a convention center. Um, so for us, a lot of our venues are, aside from like the Spring Training Stadium and we've got Westworld of Scottsdale, a lot of our venue space is actually in the hotels. And so um, I guess in a good way, the hotels have really great Wi-Fi. Now you have to be willing to pay for it, um, typically if you're the event producer or the planner. Um, but because of that, we actually don't have a lot of problems with the Wi-Fi. Um, at some of those outside venues, I think that can be a concern. Um, and, and I think as Andrew mentioned, you know, everybody just expects that you can pull something up on your phone and it's going to work. You don't want to have to even second, you know, take a second to to think about something or you've just moved on to the next to the next app or the next option for you. Um, and so I think, you know, in today's world, it's just 100% expected that it's going to work. I agree. So, so Sarah, I guess the I Wi-Fi? Is, the, yes, the, these venues have the Wi-Fi, and the event planner actually does need to put it in their budget that the Wi-Fi needs to work, and it needs to, it, it can't just be something they skimp on. Like, like it just has become an event essential. I agree. Sarah, does, does the stadium have Wi-Fi? That's the next question. Yeah, and we don't charge for it because we just consider it a way of life. You know, that's I mean, right. to us, that's, we we try to go with the all-inclusive model as much as possible just because, um, you know, why charge somebody separately for security? Our job as a venue is to keep people safe. So that's one of those basic, you know, security and Wi-Fi is kind of like food and water now. <laughs> those are two things that you just need in this day and age. And so, you know, I, I do think it's a trend. I think a lot of people are paying attention to it. I think it really depends on what the destination is for what the amenities are that, that are going to need to be standard in that particular location. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think, I think the CBD's real role is not necessarily find the most technologically savvy venue or find, you know, the most beautiful beachfront property. It's just to find whatever the client needs that is within their budget and what meets their demands. Um, you know, Andrew touched on the kind of Uber economy, and we were just at a global event summit in Scotland, and we talked a lot about that, is that sooner rather than later, that's going to hit AV companies, it's going to hit prop and rental warehouses, and it's already hit the meeting space where hotels are aggregating, saying, even if you're local, do you need a conference room for three hours? If so, here's our space, because there's a lot of small companies now that don't even have an office. So um, it, that whole kind of sharing, it, exactly, I, I see Will over there, that whole sharing economy I think is definitely going to, to have an, an impact on events soon. I agree. I agree. Fantastic. Uh, I, as we kind of wrap up the show, you know, we always end with these last two questions is, you know, starting first with, you know, if you guys had one tip, like if you could pick one thing that you would share with event planners to make their planning process easier, smoother, more effective in the economy, whatever it may be, what would be one tip you would give to event planners uh, today to make their event planning easier in 2016? Uh, let's start with Rachel. You want to give us some tips? So mine will not be surprising, but it is to work with your Convention and Visitors Bureau <laughs> in the city that you are looking at. All of our services are completely free. We have free materials. We have great connections with the city. 
Um, we have great connections with all the venues, a lot of the vendors, and again, everything we do is completely free. So it doesn't hurt to call the Convention and Visitors Bureau and see what they can do for you. Um, we can also help market events. And so there's so much that you can get with one phone call um, that can help connect you to 100 other resources without you having to use your own manpower for it. Very cool. Very cool. Sarah, what about you? What would be your one tip? So my one tip is not actually on um, servicing the event itself. I think, especially now with everything going on in the global economy, if I have one piece of advice for event professionals, especially because they're typically in small business, it is know the value of your brand and do not start to undervalue your product, your creativity, and everything that you're bringing to the table. Um, because it is an industry, it is a skill, it is a profession, and if we go through another global economic crisis where everybody slashes their prices because they want the business, it's going to be twice as hard for us to dig ourselves out of the hole the second time around um, because we're still feeling the effects of it in the events industry from the last time. So I would just say everybody needs to be very cognizant of their worth and making sure that they don't um, price adjust if anything gets a little bit more rocky in the near future. Awesome. I love how you took it from like a micro scale to this huge macro scale too. Awesome. Fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> Andrew, what about you? What would be your one tip? But you, you kind of left a question that's impossible not to be a product flood, right? So I would say all of them kind of should use Zarista, right? So make it make it sure you've got a mobile app. You know, Zarista is a great one. There's there's all kinds of different ones. I mean, we specialize in different events than other people do. Um, but it, I mean, it supercharges the value that you can give to the people going to your event to make sure that you've got something like Zarista, the the right one working for you. Awesome. Um, I I I think that's so true that I bought the company. <laughs> <laughs> that's true. That's true. Yeah, you, I literally believed in so much you bought put it. Your money, put your money where your mouth is. There it is. Exactly. Exactly. Um, and I guess one last thing we kind of end up on the show is that you know there's obviously a, you guys are a wealth of resources. You guys kind of shared some really good, cool stuff so far. Do you guys have any cool resources you'd like to share? Whether it's a website, a blog, and a new favorite pen, a uh, new favorite water bottle, or you know we've seen some really crazy stuff. A new Kickstarter campaign you saw? We saw, Is there anything we saw, you guys a, we saw a full face scuba mask last time. He wore it. He's like, check out this. Scuba oh yeah, mask. Like this weird thing. So it can get weird if you need, but. We're <laughs> Well, I'm in my own office, so I don't have any weird props around know, here like, right now. But. <laughs> your favorite tool or resource, right? Slack, whatever it may be, just something that you got you have to have to live. So for me, it uh, is go to me, webinar. <laughs> yeah, well, at the Giants, I mean, I was like I said before, and I know this is a plug on my side, but um, professional organizations, International Live Events Association, for me, is something that's been key in terms of building networks and continued education. Um, and in terms of apps, I use Trello a lot to keep my team organized and know what's coming up, and the Giants use it to manage our entire marketing portfolio. So for us, that's been a, a very valuable tool. Awesome. Yeah, we actually use GoTo to run all of our meetings to, since we have so many different offices now. So it's, um, it's awesome. I mean, it, you don't need to have an office if you've got GoTo meetings. Absolutely. We love um we love we use Zoom over at Endless um super duper love it. if you're if you're a little bit more on the you know the budget conscious side definitely Zoom is really awesome as well. Oh. By the way, I apologize. I am typing as fast as I can as far as what you guys are sharing. Any other cool apps that you guys want to share? Any books? Any resources? Websites? Um, anything like on your guys' end? Does anyone the rest have any cool eBooks to share or anything like that? We do. I, I mean, it would be if an event planner is interested in Zarista and they're in the right category. We have all kinds of white papers available, you know, for different uh, similar events that we've done. Um, but I would say, you know, if you're a CVB, check out what we're doing with, with Book Direct on, on the search engine. And um, we're launching a new product called Insight Direct that's taking all the data that we get out of our booking engine and creating a tool for CVBs to know all kinds of things, you know, how their pricing is doing over the last four years. Um, you know, where the customers are coming from, you know, what kind of price ranges they're searching on, what kind of customers are going to the CVB and what they're looking at. Um, so we're at, you know, what you're asking, we're, we're trying to create these tools that would be the resources for either event planners or for CVBs. Fantastic. Any other resources, Rachel, anything on your end? You know, something, it's probably kind of old school, but just trying to stay on top of um, trends and news and everything that's kind of going on in the industry. Um, I like News Blur, um, which helps me kind of compile all the various sites and quickly look through headlines and 
um, stay on top of all the industry news and research that's out there. Is it spelled N-E-W-S-L-E-R? Um, N-E-W-S-B-L-U-R. B-L-U-R. Oh, News Blur. Yeah. Awesome. Fantastic. Um, any last resources that you want to share? Sean, you got anything cool you want to share? Any new apps you found this week? Um, no. The FedEx app is better than the FedEx website. It's, it's, <laughs> it did well on the website. Actually, TripAdvisor Trip Advisor app is awesome for these things, too. Um, it's, it's the best app. It, while, while you get into the city, it's telling you all the things that are going on. It's, it's really you know, awesome technology now. Awesome. Um, I have one last cool resource thing that I'm like, absolutely in love with. Uh, I recently got a new backpack. So for those who don't know, in uh, three weeks, I'm going to be in Europe for two months. Um, and so it's going to be absolutely insane. So I'm trying to figure out how to pack everything and carry it around. And everyone knows who I, I love my carry-on bag. It has all these patches on it with geeky stuff all over it. Well, I had to retire the the, the, the roll-on because I knew it wasn't going to make it through the cobble streets of, you know, you know Ireland and all these places we were talking about. So I actually got this awesome backpack, which I'm totally blanking on the name right now, um, completely blanking on the name. But it's basically designed that has a day pack, like a normal backpack, attaches to the back of it. So you have your, like, clothes bag, which is huge. And attach the back, normal backpack attaches it, so you don't have to be that weird guy that has two backpacks, like one in the front and one in the back. Um, so you look super cool. All right, it works out really, really well. So highly recommend if you're ever planning on doing traveling, getting a really, really good bag. So that's my one tip for everybody. Uh, awesome. Well, um, that's give, that's pretty much the show, guys. I mean, this is pretty awesome to have you guys in here talking about how do we, you know, really boost tourism and utilize the you know, existing resources in the cities to taking our events to the next level. So I'd like to give a big round of applause to our amazing guests, Rachel, Sarah, and Andrew. Thank you guys so much for joining us today. Great, thank you. Awesome. And for everyone tuned in or if you're watching the recording, you can catch us every single week, 5 p.m. Eastern on uh, – I used to say blab, but go to webinar. If you just head over to offers.helloendless.com slash event icons, or if you go to event-icons.com, you can sign up and watch this show live every single week. Ask the questions of the amazing event icons like the ones we have in front of us today. Uh, and be sure to definitely tune in for next week's episode because it's going to be definitely amazing. So thank you again for everyone tuning in to our amazing guests, and we will see you guys all next week. <laughs>